I've been known to enjoy a bombastic fight, ripping and tearing through hordes of demons, drawing a katana faster than light for smoke and sexy combos, dropping a titan from orbit, and laying waste to the grunts that stand like ants before me. But in the end, I'll always prefer a subtler approach. For as long as I can remember, I've been a fan of stealth games, from Batman to Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, and even Skyrim. From the shadows, I've slit throats, passed without a trace, and stolen wealth from kings, queens, and emperors. Even on the tabletop, I roll stealth checks to remain hidden. A dragon is a mighty foe, but only if they can see you coming. I find solace in the darkness, alone but not alone, as you stalk through the forgotten places of the world looking for your next victim. For all these traits and more, may I present to you Dishonored 2, a game without equal that stands firmly atop the list of my favorite games of all time. And I guess this is my way of honoring the king. On the sands of sweet Circonos Did we bathe in the sun Sharing grapes from Pulero When you were the only one On the streets of Karnaka I met you long ago When the city was so peaceful And the fade seemed to grow We danced and sang Until the earth and when morning bells rang, only then we exhale. This isn't going to be a review. There are much more qualified and established creators who can tell you how the game functions mechanically and if it's worth your precious money. No, this is a love letter. An overwritten message you send to your crush at 2am. It's no secret Dishonored 2 is good. It's been out for 5 years and both it and the original are some of the most famous stealth games of all time. But I haven't taken the time to praise it in video form, so here we are. The world building of the original Dishonored was incredible. It took me to another world. The gray streets of Dunmall were my home for four years as I cut and sliced my way to a better future for the Empire. Dishonored 2 returned me to that world, and so much more. Expanding past the cramped alleyways to the edge of the world. Karnaka, the jewel of the south. The people here have their own plights. Oppressed by the Duke and threatened by the Grand Guard. The citizens just want to make enough to get by. Meanwhile, religious zealots, cultists, and gangs fight in the streets, all with their own motivation, looking to remake Karnaka in their image. As you walk the streets, merchants sell wares, fishermen haul in the day's catch, and thieves steal coin. This is a world that has been alive for far longer than you've been playing and will live on far after the game has been deleted. It's this attention to world building that makes you want to change it. A player with low chaos will see people's lives change for the better as they cunningly eliminate their targets with no bloodshed. A player with high chaos will plunge Karnaka into further war, blood flies infesting all but the most fortified buildings, and power vacuums emerge as you slaughter all those who oppose you. Even in a world as comprehensive and well-built, there are still mysteries. Beyond what we can see as players is the void, a place of endless cold, older and stranger than even its master. The Outsider, whose black eyes have seen from the beginning of time to the end. He plays games with the lives of mortals to keep himself company, granting his mark and bestowing power to those he finds most interesting. Although this world would be lacking without living people. People with motivations, people with flaws. As the game progresses, people have to accept who they are, the mistakes they've made, and move forward. Those who don't tend to end up on the other side of a blade. Take Emily. An empress who spent 15 years on the throne, daydreaming through meetings, and sneaking out for late night training sessions with her father. From her tower, the voices of her people remain unheard. Corvo, the royal protector, equally at fault with his complacency. After the first game, he thought himself untouchable. He never expected to face someone like himself again. Both of them equally surprised when the mistakes caught up to them. Delilah, a woman with the power, cunning, and spite to overthrow them. She sought those Emily dismissed and those Corvo overlooked, and turned them against the crown. She's not a politician or noble, fighting over the throne they always looked up to. She's the Emperor's bastard, firstborn even. She was steps away from that crown before she was thrown out. Marked by the outsider, she worked herself up from nothing, not just once, but twice. Just like her sister, she fell to the assassin Dowd, cast to the furthest reaches of the void. She should have been forgotten but no one forgets Delilah Copperspoon. She clawed her way back, made herself immortal, and took her throne. 
And it's not just the main characters who are fleshed out. Megan Foster, Anton Sokolov, Jindosh, Duca Bell, Vice Overseer Byrne. They're all characters with pasts, and those who aren't killed have futures as well. At the end of the game, you get to see what becomes of your actions. Who was helped, who was hindered, where these people ended up after Emily retakes the throne. But if all I wanted was a good story, I'd learn how to read. Luckily, the only thing stronger than Dishonored story is its gameplay. Dishonored 2 took what was a great stealth game with meh combat and created a stealth action game never seen before or since. Stealth is still the primary focus, of course. Stalking your enemies from the rafters, hiding under tables, or creeping up behind unsuspecting guards has never been so much fun. Throughout each level, there are many paths to take, places to hide, and secrets to find. From the sewers to the rooftops, you can stay far away from prying eyes. The stealth in this game is easy to get the hang of. Once you learn to crouch down, lean left, lean right, and hide in shadow, your intro to the stealth is done. But it's more about how your ability to use these techniques interacts with the enemy's AI. Much like their characterization, the enemies of Dishonored act like people. When they find a body, they go on alert and stay alerted. They won't just give up and return to their post. When they spot you, they investigate the area to varying degrees, depending on how much they saw. They even react when you unplug their machines. As the game progresses, you face more than just beat cops. Wolfhounds can sniff out a player even while hiding, and clockwork soldiers can hear and see far better than the average man. And while witches aren't that perceptive, they're brutal in a fight, teleporting and attacking from unexpected places. Their gravehounds respawn if not fully dispatched. Their AI isn't just to hinder you. Be clever, and their strengths quickly become weaknesses. Fire a gun or throw a grenade far away from a crowded area and quickly hide. While they're searching, sneak right past the now unguarded checkpoint. Certain bone charms can make wolfhounds not smell you, or even fight on your side. Remove the head, and clockwork soldiers can only hear, attacking friend and foe alike. Even enemy machines can be turned against them. All it takes is a rewire tool to make a wall of light turn from an impassable point to a great defense. While the stealth in this game works fantastic, it's only a matter of time before you're spotted. And whether you're stumbling into the fray or actively joining it, the combat provides just as much entertainment as the stealth. Something I love about Dishonored is its instant kill mechanic. Very rarely will you just wail on an enemy till they die. You either sneak up and assassinate them, or parry to put them off balance and initiate an instant kill. The new power attack puts enemies off balance so you can kill them without having to parry. There's even a few new environmental ways to kill people, like slamming someone's head into a window. Personally, I'm a fan of low chaos and non-lethal playthroughs. Unfortunately, Dishonored 1 only had two ways of rendering people unconscious, either sneak up and put them in a chokehold, or hit them with a sleep dart. This meant that as soon as you're spotted, you either have to run away or start murdering people. Dishonored 2 fixes that. There are combat chokeholds, throws, kicks, and drop knockouts. You can slide tackle, stun mine, yoink a man off the ground with a tentacle and suffocate them with a fucking shadow. And I guess, if you're boring, you can sleep dart them as well. The point is, combat is a massive update from the original. Oh, and the gear! You've got bullets, bolts, howling bolts, stinging bolts, incendiary bolts, sleep darts, grenades, sticky grenades, stun mines, spring razors. Find these throughout a level, or buy them from the black market. There's even some gear you can't carry with you. Find an abandoned doctor's office, take their chloroform, then chuck it at a group of enemies. Pick up some flash powder at a camera shop and blind a motherfucker with it. Don't have any grenades? Don't worry, whale oil is highly flammable. These aren't just offensive items either. You can incorporate them into stealth gameplay, lying down mines to cover you from behind, or silently taking out distant enemies with a crossbow. And now we get to my favorite part of my favorite game, the powers. I love the Outsider's Mark so much I've honestly considered getting it as a tattoo. And while the game is perfectly playable and enjoyable without powers, the Mark changes how you play. Throughout the levels, there are hidden runes and bone charms. Pieces of long dead things carved with ancient writing. These are used to obtain new powers and upgrade existing ones. Both characters have different power sets that can be tailored for stealth or assault. But there isn't enough runes to go around, so be careful how you build. Of course, they're the classics. Blink, far reach, and agility for traversal, dark vision to keep better track of your enemies, reaction time for easier parry, and bone charm crafting to create the ultimate combination of buffs. Going for a ghost run? Spend your runes on Shadow Walk or Bend Time and simply walk past your enemies. Pair Emily's Mesmerize with her domino ability and clear a room in seconds. Or use Corvo's Possession. You can take control of an enemy and walk into restricted areas. Possess a rat and crawl into a hidden crevice. 
Even blood flies can be used to sneak into places unseen. The bold among you can summon a doppelganger to fight alongside you, switching places to keep the enemies guessing, and using other powers to fight head on. After enough kills, activate the adrenaline power, instantly killing anyone who stands before you. Corvo might not have a doppelganger, but he can summon a horde of devouring rats, and tear his enemies to shreds with a cutting wind. And now, I need to tell you about the, the kick. kick. Corvo's blink kick is my second favorite move in any video game. The first being Judgment Cut End, of course. This kick allows you to ragdoll enemies, knock them into each other, and straight up kill them if you're not careful. Not only is it easy to obtain, costing only one rune, but it is the most fun you can have in this game. Kick everything. Dogs, witches, people. Kick it through doors, windows, off railings, into walls, into each other. And while they're stumbling on the ground, scrambling to get up after breaking what I assume is several ribs, Run up and kick him in the back of the head. While this video is an unbridled praise of Dishonored 2, I should mention the few issues I do have with the game. First off, Wolfhounds on higher difficulties are a bitch and a half to deal with. They can dodge past your guard and two shot you if you're not careful. And I'm not gonna lie, I don't like cracking the slab. The time switching gameplay was fun at first, but now it's just boring compared to levels where I can move more freely and experiment with powers. It also crashed my game seven times, but that might just be my Xbox being a piece of shit. And with that, I've said all I have to say. I've explained the mechanics, talked about the people, and introduced the world. I didn't really talk about the music because I'm not a musician or music theory guy, although I can say Sands of Circonos and Honor for All slap hard. If anything I said was intriguing, pick up the game and play it for yourself. I was barely exaggerating this whole time. Alright, so like or subscribe. Tune in a couple weeks from now when I talk about something equally disjointed from my other content.